Breeze Nation, what is good? It's your boy, Pat the Designer, back at it again. And the NBA season coming back has me so excited. So I figured what better way to break in that excitement than on a video talking about the three best and worst teams around the NBA. And it starts right now. Now, if you are new to the channel, please like the video. Please subscribe to the page. We do drop content on the daily on this channel. We appreciate everybody who joins in and shows love with the Breeze family. Tons of sports content coming you guys' way. But without further ado, because this is going to be a little bit of a lengthy video, I want to jump straight in on this. I mean, the three best and worst teams that we're going to see around the NBA this season. And I want to preface it with this. This is all over reaction. Right, We got to see some new faces on some of these teams, got to see some old faces come back on some of these teams, and it's game one. Some of these teams have played a couple of games here. These are my overreaction takes, but the teams that I saw that I do think this season uh, may have some issues if they don't correct things quickly, and the teams that I saw that if they keep down this path are gonna fly through. So let's jump into this. Number one team for me, the Boston Celtics. I mean, listen, um, that starting five looks elite. Uh, some of the pros and cons for me with this team, when, when I look at the starting five, it feels like they, they move in, uh, uh, what's the word right there? Simpatico, right? Like they're a team to me that you finally found that piece that could basically offset Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown having those struggles, right? Last season, that would have been one of those games where if Malcolm Brogdon has an off game, right? You're sitting there talking about, uh, well, Jalen Brown only shot four for 10 in that game and really couldn't get himself going, couldn't fight his way through. So Jason Tatum carrying the weight on the other side, who else is making something happen? Well, now you got Chris Stops Porzingis coming in as well. Offensively, I love what this team can be. And I'm not going to lie to you, defensively, seeing how Drew Holiday acclimated himself in with that Boston Celtics team so quickly was actually ridiculously impressive because Right, like he, he, I believe end of game, right? He had two huge defensive stands in a row that ends up putting the game away against the New York Knicks. And I thought that Knicks team came out, came with some firepower uh, kind of in that second half, right? And started to work things back. And you had big questions on, okay, is this the time where Jalen Brown comes back and makes something happen? And normally you would look at Jalen Brown and go, I, you know what I mean, like, Let's get it going. Come on. We need something here, but it didn't have to be him in that moment. Kristaps Porzingis is cooking. Boom. Big three. Game over. Day over. Perfect situation for the Boston Celtics there. The only con to that team to me is that uh, there is no depth on that team. I believe Joe Mazzulli ended up playing, I want to say, seven deep, maybe. No, probably eight deep. Right? I think Luke Cornett ended up getting about eight minutes in that game, but there's just not a lot of depth to that team. So health is going to be a huge concern. And that is a concern because you have a team that, like I said, that first game is built around uh, uh, Jason Tatum, Christos Porzingis, and Jalen Brown. Of course, Drew Holiday in there as well. But if Chris Stops can't stay healthy, you're pretty much right back in a similar situation that you were in last season where all right, now we got to go Tatum Brown, Tatum Brown, Tatum Brown. I, I do think that Drew Holiday helps with keeping that offense moving a little bit better, and they're going to improve as the season goes on. Let me know how you guys felt about the Celtics opening game. Do you feel like they're one of the best teams in the league right now? Second team for me, the Milwaukee Bucks last night. They look elite. Like, I, I saw how Damian Lillard was. He's got a chip on his shoulder. I think that he fits Milwaukee perfectly, right? I mean, he literally was in Portland, comes over here. Now he's in Milwaukee. He fits that team perfectly. Seeing Giannis have a running mate that can actually do something on a consistent basis is interesting to see. My favorite thing is, right, seeing Giannis or seeing Dame in that picture with them uh, preseason. And he's like, I've never been a part of a picture like this where it's him, mid, Giannis, Brooke Lopez, right? Like, there's so many pieces on that team. I think the depth on that team is still really good as well. You're able to bring in Bobby Portis, right? You've still got Marjan Bochamp, who's turning into a nice player himself, right? Like, there's a lot of pieces on that team that were on that team initially and still fit really well together. But, like, a game like last night where Chris Middleton 
you know, just really didn't get it going. Six points, I think he had. It was nothing crazy. And you you look at, and again, right, he's coming off of the injuries and all of that. So this is kind of him working himself back in. But you look at those games in last season, that would have been a game where you would have needed Giannis to do it all himself versus Philly, who's also, listen, Philly is it looked pretty good last night as well. I think there's a couple of things they need to tweak, but they look pretty good as well. But when you watch that game last night, to me, um, it, when Damian Lillard starts taking over in the fourth quarter, that's the thing that you haven't been able to have with some of the role players that you've had on that team. Now you've got a legitimate superstar next to Giannis, and I think that's going to be crazy scary as the season goes on. Uh, now, my only con to this team is that Adrian Griffin looked lost. <laughs> and I know, right, first NBA coaching uh, first NBA game as a head coach, right? Like, and he's he's going to, you know, grow as he goes through that process. But I, there was a lack of a system to me. I think that Dame was just kind of out there hooping. He was playing free, which is something you want to do, right? But there was, Giannis just was floating kind of in that fourth quarter. He didn't really know where to be without the ball in his hands. I think you have to have a system that keeps him engaged, keeps him involved in the game plan because on some of those plays, right, you see Giannis floating and Brooke kind of just both in the corner. Giannis isn't shooting a three. Come on, bring Brooke up. Let him set that off ball screen. Giannis can roll when Dane takes the shot. He Now you got a man down there who's Giannis freaking on Kumpo. And when the ball comes off, he can be down there, grab the board, go right back up, do what he does. Keeps him engaged in the game. Keeps him running to the rim. There needs to be some kind of system in place for me when I'm looking at what the Milwaukee Bucks do. It, it felt like, and I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not a big fan of Coach Bud. I think that he's a little bit better Billy Donovan uh, and maybe not even a little bit better, right? I mean, listen, that finals run, I didn't sit there and talk about how elite the coaching was. I sat there and talked about how elite Giannis and, and Drew Holiday were. Um, but, you know, like, it, it feels like Coach Bud, right? Again, like, I watched the game and I was like, yes, the Bucks won. That was a good game. I like what I saw from it, but... I, I don't feel like we saw these elite sets. I don't feel like uh, there was a system that that kept guys uh, 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 moving around. It kind of just turned into watch Dane go off, which is what he did in Portland. And that's not going to be the recipe for a championship. But even with all of that said, right, that's my only con right now. And Adrian Griffin has to learn. He's learning on the job as he goes through all of this, right? My only con here is something that came in a win for the Milwaukee Bucks because the players that you have on that team are that good. I would just like to see a little bit more of a utilization from them. And then finally, um, there's there's only, I mean, like last, but definitely not least, if anything, out of all of these teams, this is the best team out of the bunch right now. Uh, the Denver Nuggets are absolutely freaking ridiculous absolutely ridiculous because they might honestly be the most balanced depth team in the NBA. I don't know if you guys got to watch that first game versus the Los Angeles Lakers, but I mean, as you go through the numbers on this, right? Like you've got one, two, three, four, five guys who scored in double digits in that game, five separate guys who ended up scoring in double digits in that game. Of course, Jokic is the focal point. And he's the one that everything's running through. He facilitated the ball excellently. Um, I thought that they did some really good things defensively as well, which to me, you know, like that was a little bit of a surprise on. Now, I don't want to say a surprise, but seeing them go out there and be as good in longer stretches as they were defensively, I thought was really something interesting to see. Jamal Murray, Contavious Caldwell Pope, Michael Porter Jr., uh, 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 Aaron Gordon all scoring in double digits and then you get to the bench unit and you got one, two, three, four, five more guys able to get buckets on the board there. And and I mean, at the end of the game, right, the, the game ended up being a little bit more of a blowout. Uh, I got a little closer towards the end, but you know, the, the Nuggets pretty much handled that game the entire time. But when you go from Jamal Murray to Reggie Jackson, who's been a starting point guard in this league and, and is still incredibly uh, uh, efficient, at what he does from the three-point line, right? Like being able to knock down that three ball, being able to attack downhill, being able to facilitate things. Like even looking at a guy like Najee and seeing how he's getting incorporated into what the, the Denver Nuggets do, 
Uh, it just it just feels like everybody knows their role. There's a championship level pedigree there. And now you've got that continuity built on top of it. Continuity is a good thing in the NBA. I know Bulls fans are cringing hearing that word right now, but it's a good thing in the NBA. And I'm really excited to see what this Nuggets team is. My only con for this team, which I think you could say is the con for every team in the NBA, uh, is that there's an over-reliance on Jokic. If he goes down, it's over. But that's every team with one star, pretty much. Like they have one superstar. And then they have, you know, your your stars that come up behind that. But if that's your biggest con, you're doing pretty good. Especially coming off a championship season. And he's an absolute monster. Uh, my honorable mention on this, I want to get this in as well. By the way, like the video, subscribe to the page, man. We're going to be dropping content like this a lot more on the channel. NBA content, NFL content. Uh, maybe even get some NHL in there with what Connor Bedard's doing over there as well. But... Um, my honorable mention here is uh, the Clippers. The Clippers looked absolutely great. Now, they might actually have one of the better depths in the NBA. The only reason I didn't put Clippers on this list as my best team right now, one, because they played Portland, and Portland looked like they had no idea what was happening on the court. It looks like a young team. It does. It looks like a very young team. And then... Uh, but seeing that, and then just the health of the team, right? Like, we don't know what the heck... Kawhi is going to be hopefully he's able to play more than the 65 games and they're going to be able to go out there and but Russ looked great Paul George looked great Kawhi looked great the depth of that Clippers team looked great so they're my honorable mentions team those are my three best teams in the NBA right now now comes the fun part my three worst teams in the NBA I'm starting it off here. I thought that uh, Washington would be a little bit more competitive uh, to start things off. Um, I guess a pro for this team, and I'm giving pros and cons for every team. A pro for this team is that they got plenty of offense. They got plenty of guys on this team that can score the ball with Kuz uh, 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 and Jordan Poole out there, right? Like you saw them kind of be able to get after, even though Poole ended up, I don't know what the situation is with Jordan Poole, right? Like, it, uh. All of a sudden, I think that was that first game of like, hey, coach, you want to just let me shoot the ball? No, you don't. All right, well, we're going to have a we're going to have this situation. But uh, DeLon Wright, Jordan Poole, Kyle Kuzma, um, Danilo Gallinari a little bit. Yeah, I mean, they're still 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 doing some things well. I don't know if that'll that last the whole season, but they could still score the basketball uh, at a really high clip. Here's their biggest problem. They can't defend a G League team. Uh, there is no defense on this team. And I went and watched. Here's the thing. This is not just me talking and looking at numbers. And, and I do have, you know, their numbers on my on my note sheet here. But I actually went back and watched all of these games because I wanted to make sure that it wasn't just based on the numbers, what I'm looking at here. They couldn't defend the the Windy City Bulls. Like, their defensive rotations, their, their uh, 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 j just... And maybe it's, maybe it's, I don't even know how to explain it, Like right? Like maybe it's just because there's so many new pieces there when really there's only one major new piece there uh, and you don't have Chris stops and things change like that. But it, it just, it looked bad the entire night. At no point did it look like, wow, that's a really good defensive rotation there, guys. This is a really good couple of defensive stands. Like they just looked like they were like, we're gonna outshoot everybody. And if we don't outshoot you, we're going to lose this game. And in fact, they did. I believe they lost that game by, uh, yeah, 23, 143 to 120. They lost the game where they scored 120 points. Yeah, they're not going to be good this season. Uh, Jordan Poole might put up 35. I still have him as my most improved player of the year because I think he's going to, uh, I think he's going to improve his points per game total by about 10. Uh, because as you can see, they're just shooting the basketball. That's all they're doing this year. They're just letting it fly. Um, number two for me, worst teams, worst teams, worst teams in the NBA. <sighs> this pains me to say it, uh, but the Chicago Bulls. Chicago Bulls looked absolutely horrible in their first game. There were some things they did well, and one of the pros for me is that actually that the young players showed up and uh, and showed you some things that you feel a little bit good about, right? Kobe White, I thought, did a really good job going out there and being able to you know, contribute offensively uh, at the start. I thought he had some good rotations defensively as well. Patrick Williams, to me, was very aggressive. Uh, he only ended up taking uh, 10 shots, but got a, got some good buckets early in there. 
getting downhill, making an impact. I thought defensively he made a really good impact on the floor as well. Um, and when he was out there with certain uh, lineups and rotations, you really felt his presence out there. Um, but the biggest con for this team is that word that I used before, continuity. The continuity seems like it did absolutely nothing for this team. Feels like we saw so much of the same uh, that we saw last season. And uh, unfortunately, that feels like kind of just where this team is going to be this year. I hope that, they, I mean, like, I think that there will be an improvement. We're having players only meetings already. Um, so I'm hoping that there'll be an improvement from what we saw in game one here uh, coming up versus the Raptors. That game is going to be happening tonight. But it was, there was so much bad. There was so much bad in this game that I really don't know. Uh, how much of an improvement we're going to see. And really just in that fourth quarter, right? Like there were, it, it one, the Bulls could knock down a shot, but two, right? Like it just felt like in the fourth quarter, these guys didn't have the continuity. These guys didn't play well with each other. These guys didn't go out there and are running it back for their third straight time. And uh, I'm really concerned about my Bulls. I'm not going to lie to you. Right now, they look like one of the worst teams in the NBA. And it's not just because, you know, they, they end up losing that game to OKC. You're on your third year of continuity, and it looks like guys don't know how to play with each other. Heck, you couldn't throw an entry pass into the post. That's mad concerning. Now, do I think that there's some upside that could be coming from this? Possibly. But, I mean, we're going to know here real quick. Bulls schedule is not easy. And so they're, we're going to know here fairly quickly uh, what this Bulls team uh, is going to be moving forward here. And then finally, my number three team that uh, is the absolute worst team in the NBA right now, um, the Rockets. My pros for the Rockets, there's 81 games left. That's all I got. Like that, that would you pay money for? I mean, my con for the Rocket is uh, they still haven't figured out who the best team on the, on the uh, best player on the team is. Um, to me, I, I really do believe that it's Alfred Sengun. I know a lot of people don't look at him as that, but it's because they don't utilize him as that. But when they do utilize him as that offensively, I'm speaking on now and in defense, ugh, take your pick, right? Like there's not a little, you got Dylan Brooks. That's what you got for defense. But Alfred Sengun to me is... Um, clearly the best player on that team. I know some people will look at Van Vliet and say, well, he's able to do this. He can score. And these guys put up 14 points in their, in their debut here uh, and against the Orlando Magic, who, I mean, the Magic have a 17 guard rotation and then a couple of, and like a 17 center rotation as well. Like, I don't, I don't understand the Magic in the slightest, but just, I mean, they literally made me scratch my head when I was re-watching the Rockets game because I was just like, it doesn't feel like I may brought a system down here. It doesn't feel like uh, these guys are, I, I get it, it's early on and you're not used to playing together, but my God, 83 to, what was it, 120? Like you got the doors blown off of you uh, in your first game. Let me see, what was that? What did that game end up finishing out at? Uh, let me go to the Rockets here. Hold on, give me a second. Game tracker, game tracker. 116 to 86. You got beat by 30 to start your season. 30. And this was not just, the, they just look like they have no idea what system they're supposed to be running. They looked like they had, I mean, defensively, again, I could look at them and the Wizards in the same way. They couldn't stop a G League team. Offensively, um, you got a bunch of guys who just, I mean, like they put up shots, but it's a bunch of like, you know, everybody's putting up 10 shots. This ain't the Raptors. Somebody's got to be the offensive go-to guy and you got to, you got to go. And to me, Shingun is the, is the easiest one to go with because right. He was six for 11 and I shot 54% from the field, had 14 points in the game, but I only saw him really get going kind of in that second half in the first, or I'm sorry, um, in the in the first half right like you really only saw them go to him in that first half he was six for seven in the first half he really didn't see the ball much in the second half right gets four shots up you kind of go away with him you're trying to go with van vliet and let him do some things there uh Eamon thompson was three for eight i mean like it, it was bad it got bad quick and they they just look like a team that is completely disjointed uh and those are my three worst teams in the nba my honorable mention um, it is the Atlanta Hawks uh, who got beat by the Charlotte Hornets, who I also don't think is a very good team. I just don't think they're the worst team. Um, and 
the the context on that it still doesn't fit that team does not fit together like there, there's there's nothing about the Atlanta Hawks that looks consistent um it, uh the, like I, I I don't even know right like them running it back and I get it you traded for DeJounte Murray so you had to run it back you couldn't uh uh go out there and not you know utilize these guys but you're making both Trey Young and DeJounte Murray worse putting them together in my opinion you're making them both worse by putting them together because both of them need the ball in their hand to operate and it feels like a great value uh, version a very great value very great value right like top shelf great value version (laughs) or bottom shelf, I guess, depending on how you describe it, version of the the Boston Celtics, where you sit there and go, well, we've got these two guys, maybe Celtics last year, right? Where we've got these two guys, yeah, but neither, both of them need the ball in their hand for them to be elite. And you don't have somebody that can kind of separate the two of them apart. So what are you really doing there? Like, I, I, it just doesn't fit to me. I think they'll still be an okay team, but that's the one for me that's, that's the biggest head scratcher uh, as far as big money guys on the team, right? Like, I know, right, the Bulls are kind of in that same category of head scratcher uh, when it comes to uh, big money guys on the team. But at the end of the day, neither DeMar nor Zach are making that much. You got Trey Young and DeJounte Murray out here. And I mean, both of them went four for 19, three for 14, shot 21. Both of them shot 21% from the field. It's actually impressive. But I don't want to harp on the honorable mentions too much. They're not in my worst category. Just to recap real quick, my three best teams that I think are going to be in the league, Celtics, Bucks, and Denver, and my three worst, Wizards, Bulls, and Rockets. Let me know how you guys feel in the comments below. I'll be down there talking with you as well. As always, Menace Boy Path the Designer, back at it again. Y'all stay safe out there, man. Peace.